The lymphoid system are the white blood cells that are essential to fighting infection. They are um, stationed in different parts of the body, essentially every part of the body, but are largely stationed in the lymph nodes, in the spleen, in the bone marrow. They're rapidly dividing cells, so a lymphoma would be a cancer of those lymphoid cells or a, a cancer of the white blood cells that are called lymphocytes. CLL is one of the subtypes of lymphoma. CLL is one of the rare subtypes that occurs in about 8% of patients. It is a leukemia, and so largely these abnormal cells are in the circulation. It's the most common leukemia that we see in the U.S. There's between 18,000 and 19,000 new cases that occur per year, and there are several hundred thousand people living in the United States with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So CLL is diagnosed most frequently in the absence of symptoms. Most patients present to their primary care physician. They have a thorough evaluation on a once a year basis. They have a CBC performed, which stands for complete blood count. And, there's, and it's noticed that the white blood cells are, are elevated. Oftentimes those patients are presumed to have an infection. They receive a brief course of antibiotics and it stays elevated on persistent counts. And then they're referred to the um, hematologist or an oncologist for an evaluation. Most patients with CLL are asymptomatic at the time of diagnosis. It's very rare that we see a patient who has really significant symptoms. It's most often incidentally diagnosed. In terms of treating CLL, there are many different options for patients. It used to be up until a few years ago that the only standards of care were chemotherapies, traditional cytotoxic chemotherapies in combination with or without antibody-based therapy. The paradigm is changing, tr changing dramatically over the last couple of years. Since 2014, we've had four targeted agents approved for treating patients with CLL, ibrutinib, idelalisib, venetoclax, and duvalisib, just to name a few of the drugs that are in development. So the, the shift has largely been away from chemotherapy, more towards targeted therapies. Most of our targeted therapies are all oral, which is again a dramatic improvement for patients. And these drugs have incredible activity and ha are actually helping patients to live longer. The major focus in development has been that we understand drug targets and what particular targets are abnormal in the CLL cells as compared to the normal lymphoid system. Ibrutinib was approved in 2014. It targets an enzyme called BTK. Around the same time, idelalisib was approved, and it also targets its own particular uh, unique enzyme, which is abnormal, called PI3K delta. Duvalisib is another oral targeted therapy which was recently approved. It, it focuses on the same target. And venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor, was approved, and that focuses on uh, a target called BCL2. Many different drugs are in development, which also focus on similar or related targets. There's been a tremendous explosion in immunotherapies, antibody-based therapies, and we're even now on the cusp of using the immune system or cellular therapies to treat CLL. We are now really entering an era where most of the therapies in the front line are used similarly both frontline and in the relapse refractory setting. The issue with relapse CLL is that you have to understand what the patient's history is. You have to know what they had for prior lines of therapy, the reasons why they discontinued those therapies, and one of the big areas in terms of our research is trying to sequence therapies. So I know, for example, if you had ibrutinib as your first therapy, venetoclax is a very active agent. Another example might be if you had chemotherapy combinations as your first therapy, ibrutinib might be a great choice for that patient. So reasons for discontinuation, patient comorbidities, and prior therapies are very important to understand. This is most important in the relapse refractory setting. Clinical trials are incredibly important in CLL. I've talked about ibrutinib, idelalisib, venetoclax, duvalisib, obinutuzumab. Just a few years ago, those were the drugs that were being studied in the context of clinical trials. At every opportunity when we see a patient at our center, we think about whether or not they're appropriate for a clinical trial. I think one of the biggest misconceptions in CLL is that clinical trials should be reserved for end of life or last line of defense. That isn't the case. Most of the clinical trials that we participate in aren't trials that have placebos, for example. We often know what patients are receiving, and most of the designs are just a slight tweak of the current standard of care to try to improve outcomes even further. So we always encourage patients to think about clinical trials. We encourage patients to be seen at centers where clinical trials are available for consideration. They're not always the right answer for patients, but oftentimes it allows us to have access to drugs that we think will be the standard of care in the next couple of years and to have access and experience to them sooner for our patients. CLL is a disease where there is tremendous heterogeneity at the time of diagnosis. 
About a third of patients are never treated throughout the entire course of their lifetime. About a third are treated at some point during the course of their lifetime and about a third are treated almost immediately. I think in order to best understand what to do at the time of diagnosis, it's important to see a specialist in CLL, not only because of their expertise, but also because they oftentimes come with a team that are specialized in CLL. These include nutritionists, pharmacists, nurses, advanced practitioners, social workers, patient support groups, and also connections to the clinical trials and connections to the advocacy groups that oftentimes are able to provide educational material to patients. And so for a patient who's newly diagnosed who might be scared, they think they have a leukemia, they th think it may impact tremendously on their life expectancy, they need to find a physician and a team that are comfortable with the disease and the diagnosis, who can provide the education, and oftentimes, most importantly, the reassurance, and develop a plan that allows them to go on with as close to their normal life style and allow them to lead a life that has a normal life expectancy. If you've been thinking about CLL at all in the last couple of years, the entire message has been about hope. And CLL is one of the diseases in an oncology that for the entire time that it's been known has been leading the way in terms of progress. Science in general has been very interested in studying CLL because we've had access to those abnormal cells through the blood. Unlike breast cancer or lung cancer where it's really hard to get a sample of tissue to study to try to determine why drugs are working or not, CLL cells are readily available just by phlebotomy. Because of that and because of some advances in terms of understanding immunology and disease biology, there has been an explosion of new therapies. When you think about it, it's remarkable for a disease that represents a very, very small number of the cases of cancer diagnosed in the country, there's been an unbelievable number of advances made, both in terms of research and in terms of approvals of agents for these patients. And so not only are the agents active, but they're demonstrating that patients are living longer, they have relatively favorable side effect profiles, and their schedules are reasonable for patients. Whereas a few years ago, you know, to receive chemotherapy, you had to sit in the office for six hours, you had to come in multiple days in a row. Oftentimes when I treat a patient now with CLL, I'm prescribing a targeted agent, they take a pill per day. It's a lot different. And those drugs seem to work just as good as those more advanced, more toxic combinations. And so it's a combination of an explosion of knowledge in terms of biology, an interest level on the part of patients and physicians, and the development of some agents that seem to work incredibly well at helping patients to live long and to have a good quality of life. LRF is a really important organization for patients and providers. LRF has resources available that really aren't necessarily available in most practices. The educational material are second to none. Unlike other societies where it's sort of general information about lymphoma, the educational materials provided by LRF are disease specific. And so for example, when I see a patient with CLL, there's an LRF related book that's over 100 pages that provides really up-to-date information for patients. LRF is very supportive in terms of educational events. So patients are able to get together, share their experiences, ask questions, not only of one another, but also of the providers who are oftentimes have an international reputation who are willing to provide their time to the LRF and the patients who are associated with LRF.